I think the body has everything to do with the restoration. I think back when I had a much more simplified understanding of what I was doing, I'd say, well, the body is home or the body is a site of all human experience. I've said that many times. It is. It is. It's where we live our lives. We are living. I'm not a human body in my life. I'm living. That's who I am. Hey folks, welcome to the Brilliant Body Podcast, a forum to learn about and liberate the brilliance of your body and ultimately to expand the meaning and experience of intelligence. Join me, Ali Mize, and other body masters to explore pioneering and varied perspectives on what it means and feels like to be embodied. So many people feel disconnected from their bodies due to emotional or physical pain or even conditioning and lack of education. Others feel quite at home in their bodies, yet want to learn to have more pleasure, awareness, and access to the body's guidance. This podcast is for everybody. Each one of my trailblazing guests has studied their own bodies and others' bodies for decades and will share their expertise and unique mission, how to thrive as a body. So join us and reclaim your body's brilliance. Amber Gray is a human rights psychotherapist and a somatic and dance movement therapist who has worked with survivors of interpersonal, collective, and intergenerational trauma, particularly torture, war, and human rights abuses for 25 years. Amber provides clinical and transformational training on her right to embody trainings, integrating refugee mental health and torture treatment with creative arts, mindfulness, and body-based therapies for programs serving survivors worldwide. She regularly facilitates retreats for survivors and caregivers and practitioners serving communities affected by injustice, oppression, and trauma. So I first met Amber Gray about 10 years ago in a continuum workshop that she was offering in Los Angeles. And I was a newly minted trauma therapist and a lifelong dancer. And here was somebody who had merged the two in such a fascinating way. And as you're about to learn, Amber has gone all over the world with her extraordinary disciplines and expertise in order to help victims of trauma, warfare, torture, mutilation, rape, you name it, the bad stuff people have experienced. Amber has been there to help people through it. Amber's an extraordinary person, which was obvious to me from the get-go. And so I'm thrilled that Amber accepted this invitation and took some time out from her busy schedule to join us. I have never met anyone like her. She truly is a global treasure. So without further ado, my amazing guest, Amber Gray. I'm just so thrilled that we are staying connected after all these years. I haven't actually seen you in a good 10 years or so since I took that amazing workshop that you gave in Los Angeles at the studio. So you did a... And we went to Whole Foods together. I don't even remember that. Oh, I have... Like you're still viscerally present in like all of that. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I know. It was like a mutual fan society immediately. I, I won't speak for you, but it, I was I no, totally. immediately adored you and still do. And as these things seem to go, I just learned so much more about you than I knew then because I hadn't really read your bio. I didn't really care at the time. I just I read what you were offering in this workshop, which was using movement to help trauma heal trauma. Yeah. And that was enough for me. I was like, I'm in. I, I belong in this place with this person. And so I was just reading your bio. And besides all the illustrious things you've done in the world, what struck me the most is how eclectic you are, how expansive, and how you have woven together so many different disciplines and expertise. And being somebody who has done that quite a bit in my own life, though I I think not even to the extent you have, I wanted to ask you about that. You just spoke about hoarding. So To me, they might be similar. Exactly. There's this constant collection of more and more value. And sometimes with that value comes things we don't necessarily need. 
right. as well, or that just clutters our mental, emotional, and professional space. Yeah. Or does it? And I just wanted to talk to you about from one eclectic collector to another. What is that like for you? And what was it like when you were a child? Did you have a sense that, okay, my interests are so vast and varied that I can feel what I want to be, but it might take me 50 years to to become that? Or did you know what you wanted to be? Like, did you know you wanted to be a dancer? Did you know you wanted to be a healer? Was it clear? And then it just kept mushrooming. Hmm. So have you have you been funneling out all your life or you, did, were you just funneling in? Like, I'm just really fascinated by how you became you professionally and of course, personally. That's such a great, I love that image. When you say funneling out and funneling in, I think about a spiral. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that we are constantly, if we're paying attention and if we have the ability, and I don't mean that necessarily as just a skill, but there has to be a lot of things in place. I'm so grateful for really loving, supportive parents and relatively safe environments and all of that. But we keep spiraling into the center of who we are and then spiraling out. I remember wanting to be a princess. I remember probably wanting to be a queen. I think at one point I wanted to be an astronaut. Like I wanted to be you know how little kids we go through things. I wanted to be a movie star, right? I think one thing that has allowed this spiraling in and out is that I had two people in my parents who believed in me no matter what I said. So there was this generosity of explore and decide and choose through your own spirit, soul, body experience, not just what you do, but who you are. And it wasn't always explicitly stated. And as I've learned, because I lost both my parents in 21, having not had a lot of major losses other than Emily Conrad, Manchun, my spiritual mother in Haiti before that. But I learned how when those who are really important in our lives die or pass on, it was almost like I got to know my parents in a deep, cellular, intimate, spiritual way because everything was stripped away that it maybe we could call personality. So I've appreciated that the word that I'm really playing with is discovery. I think it's all been and still is discovery. So I didn't really think ahead. And I remember once, (laughs) I'll make a long story short, I was doing temp work at agencies to make some money. Like I think it was on a summer between, I don't know what. And I worked with a person, I remember this person seemed like the opposite of me. Like every hair was always in place. Like clothes were always totally neat. Everything was so precise and organized. It freaked me out. Actually, it freaked me out. And I remember her saying to me, I'm going to do this for this many years. And then this and this was buying the house, having the kids. It was the plan that is a social narrative that we have in the United States. It's the thread you're supposed to follow. And I remember I was a big WTF. I was like, what? For me, it's that is interesting. That is captivating. I'm curious about that. I want to dive in and being open to whatever emerges. So I don't think I knew I'd study public health when I left college. I think it was an idea. And it came out of my experiences working in the very, very early days of HIV and AIDS with the gay men's health crisis. It was being in international development, which is a joke. It's colonialism. It's just the ongoing exportation of American colonialism. When I realized, Mm. no, I can't do this. And I went to work. I went back to school to study massage therapy and herbs and healing and got together with some of the witches that I knew and decided to do all of that because I was like, no, change has to happen individually. These organizations are just too, they're institutionalized. And so all the magic is gone. And and I think that's another word. And just of the holiday season that we're in, I've been trying to explain to my husband who sometimes looks at me a little cross, I still believe in magic. I still believe in magic. I, I do. I always will. And I keep asking him, do you believe in magic? <laughs> Whether it's the sparkling lights and the stars or whatever it is. So it's like 
discovery and magic. Where's the magic? So I followed that and ended up back in Rwanda through just a bunch of twists and turns. And then I was like, oh, I want to go deeper with the psychological work, the body based work. I had an experience that led me right to dance movement therapy. But it's all threads that I think it's more like when I watch people weave, you know, it's weaving a thread at a time. I think it's the threads, they're emergent. Emergence is a really good term. I follow the emergence and I might be following none or three at the same time or one. And they just naturally spiral together. So that's the answer. Do you feel like there's more threads that keep weaving in and maybe a funnel isn't a fair metaphor because you use this gesture of coming in and going out and coming in and going out, or you first set a spiral, which implies that you can expand for more and then they come in and integrate and then expand and take in more and integrate. And yet, as you said, there's a discovery and an emergence. I just find this so interesting. I would term it almost like you keep following the breadcrumbs, it sounds. And I think funnel is a great term. I think of funnel web spiders, like they're terrifying Mm -hmm. down in Australia. Their webs are actual funnels. So it's also a web. It's that shape of gathering and harvesting and then going out. It's a funneling. It's a weaving. It's a spiraling. It's discovery. It's really discovery. I was listening to your interview with Gil, which I got really excited because I was like, this person is a professional soulmate. Everything was so brand new, strikingly rich that he said, but also deeply familiar in my soul. I think of my teacher, Tony Lee, he's a Larakia man in Darwin, Australia, as I'm trying to understand what the dream time is, which is not my place to talk about. And my understanding of it, that it is now, and then it's the next moment, but it's the past. It's like the weaving that's happening all the time. When people talk about the dream time, they often think about it as past, but we're always creating it. So that's it. I acknowledge with deep respect and profound sadness how many people don't have those opportunities. I don't want to be sound glib and everybody can do this. There's so many constraints, whether it's society, oppression, racism, the the socioeconomic inequity, the direction that human beings have taken the world, which I'm really unhappy about. And not all human beings, but especially what's going on today. Those choices have eliminated this for so many people because at some point the environment does suppress, repress, and then oppress our ability to discover freely or to have that sense of access and accessibility and ability opportunities. And belief in magic. Yeah. Yeah. Be quite natural in children. And yet, of course, it gets squelched and even punished out of a lot of children. Yeah. And I think that's at the root of a lot of the conditions we're seeing today in children. My work as a psychotherapist, human rights psychotherapist, and dance movement therapist, I'm very somatically based, but I also hold the mainstream title and see clients in a more mainstream way. All these diagnoses that are getting slapped on kids and adults as a result of childhood, I think stem from this. I used to say bluntly, I don't really support the diagnosis of ADHD and all of that. And it's hard to say that now when it's so used, it's so common. But I think we have to look at what have we done. My childhood was woods, lady slippers. I don't ever see lady slippers anymore when I go to the East Coast. Frogs, a river that went into a pond that had big marshes. And a lot of it was about tactile discovery and watching things in the grass and toys that were, we had Barbie dolls and stuff, but we also had wooden toys and the devices. I keep hearing people try to justify the use of devices and it's changing our brain and our nervous system. It just is. Yeah, and it sounds like how you discovered and were allowed to be creative and thrilled to be creative was very much through your body, with your body, as your body. Yes. Whereas being with the screen, it's really hard to even feel your body. People every now and then will say, oh, yeah, I can do it. And then I sit there and go, what's wrong with me? But 
And this is a device. It's useful. It's connecting you and I right now during the pandemic. Got really useful. But I think the human condition we're in, the acceleration, and what I perceive as a longing for immediacy, not the immediacy of the body, but let me learn this. Let me cut and paste these workshops, get a certificate, and then be the expert. This need for things to happen quickly is feeding into this. And it's it's chicken and the egg. I don't know. Everything is speeding up. And a lot of it does have to do with technology. And then we're getting, and I'm saying we very broadly, but then there's this hunger or this, oh, well, I can just do this and then I'll be this. And then I can teach this or then I can offer this. We're losing the appreciation for deep immersion mentoring. Again, I think of teachers like Emily. She mentored me for years. Manshun, my spiritual mother, mentored me for years. The old way, the wisdom way of learning things. And again, this is what really struck me about your interview with Gil, is I just got a sense of being open to whatever emerges and continue to ask the questions even if it rocks your world, even if it blows what you think is true out of the water, be open to that. So, yeah, I think that's part of what's contributing to a lot of what we're seeing today. I'm very concerned, actually. You have seen more of the world and more of the worst of humanity than a lot of people I know. Maybe everybody I know. How has that contributed to your sense of either optimism or pessimism? with what's going on in the world today? I'd like to say that I'm probably in, and I'll use the term, a braid of optimism and pessimism, and that the third braid is, is hopefully realism. <laughs> no. I'm equally discouraged and inspired. I'm equally horrified and mortified, and then just exalted, however you would say that, at what humans are capable of. So in seeing the worst, I've also seen the best. I don't know if I would survive what a lot of my clients have survived. Resilience is a word that became overused and commodified, but there is a deep resilience in so many people that I think is body and spirit. That's the way I look at it, not that I separate them. So I think when I look at the world today, I still have the hope that emerges from the capacities, and I use that word intentionally, the capacities. It's a word I started using a long time ago as a clinician when I had to do all these PTSD and depression and anxiety scales, and I developed a scale for social relational capacity. It's just a rich, a richer word. Our capacity to support, survive, heal, regenerate when we're going through really horrible things. I mean, my clients who tortured throughout the night and just having a glimpse of maybe a sunstream or a smell of a flower that keeps them going to the next day and the next day that becomes five or 10 years of incarceration and torture. There's that. And then there's the horrible things that we keep doing. And people often ask me, why do you think human beings can torture one another? Why do they hurt one another? And I think it's, I think it's because we just keep making the wrong choices. And I have a theory about this because I think, I don't want to get too far astray, but I think about neuroplasticity, which that term goes way back, I think to the 50s or 60s, somewhere I have notes about who termed it and all of that. I was just listening to somebody about that yesterday, Eagleman. The neuroscientist talking about it literally came from when they were doing plastic molds and how plastic could keep its form. And that he, therefore he doesn't like that term because it implies a certain staticness yeah. having a mold and keeping it. So he uses live wire. But anyway, it's interesting because I was just listening to that yesterday. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, so much of that has emphasized the human brain, which is a really important yes organ circuitry i'm going to call it a process it's not static it's an actual process of integration and synthesis and it dances the brain literally dances as does a nervous system but the emphasis on the brain and how experience changes the brain people often leave off that doesn't become part of the brain those neural pathways aren't formed if we don't 
deeply rest. So there has to be the big pauses, the quiet, but also the emphasis on the brain to me paralyzes our choices we're making. I feel like evolution is a force that guides us, but we're also guiding it. We have choices and we keep exalting the human brain as this evidence. That when I was a kid, it was the top of the totem pole, the top of the evolutionary pathway, because I don't want to misappropriate the term totem pole, but that's how it was taught to me. And this is the roots of white supremacy, that we are over everything else with our mastery and our sophistication. But it's the brain. And to me, the center of our intelligence is our heart. It's our heart. And I get a lot of this transmission from whales. So I actually get it from other species and from my spiritual teachers. But that's the spiraling to me, the spiraling heart up to the brain, which there's a lot of communication, highly myelinated vagus nerve and all that. And then the quieter transmission, belly to heart. The way that we keep focusing on the brain seems to me to be the path that we've chosen towards development. I just keep hearing people talk about the term undeveloped land. It's land. It's not just sitting there waiting for you to oppress it with the weight of a building and squeeze all the microorganisms out of the soil. Because that's what it does. It actually, the building I'm sitting in is crushing life. And look at what we've done to the planet. It's not accumulation, wealth. And I get stuck in this all the time. I was raised in Connecticut. I was raised in the town that inspired the Stepford Wives. So this, we have to have this and that, and your car has to be new every so many years. And what's the latest color? Is it chartreuse? Whatever it is, this accumulation, that seems to me that is a path of greed. And it's not a path of generosity and love. And I think that's part of going back to your question about a pessimism or optimism. I still have hope because of what I've seen is possible and what I've seen human beings do and what I've seen non-humans or more than humans, animals do. And I'm pretty disgusted at the choices we keep making and pretty frustrated. and realistically, I give us 20 to 30 years as a species. And my hope and prayer is that the many species that we've been taking down through our greed and our inconsideration for our actual, our real job, which is to steward this planet because we're part of it, I hope they don't all go down too or before us. The world's going to be fine without humans. The world doesn't need us at all. People get really mad when I say that. This planet does not need us. So that might sound pessimistic, but I actually think it's very realistic. I've heard that young people are coming up with a lot more energy to work with the environment and to take care of species. And I hope that's true. I hope that's the surge. There's also the devices that a lot of people are being raised on now. It's not the same juicy dimensionality to relate to a device or whatever they do. Snapchat, all these things, that's not real embodied communication, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much the heart's transmission is really reaching. So uh, that was quite a uh... <laughs> big answer for a big question. Yeah. So tell us about whales. I know you go regularly to go commune with them, and I'm sure we'd all love to hear about that. And what have you learned from them? Whales came to me in a dream, probably might have been, I got to think how old I am, 40 years ago now, which is how I became curious about them. I was raised near the ocean and on the ocean. My dad was a fisherman. We were out in the boat a lot. So very much an ocean person. Didn't have a lot of interactions with whales. But I had this dream that foretold my father's death and foretold the compassion I didn't, I, I knew it was, I knew the dream when I woke up was about my father's death. What I realize now is that these four whales who are like doing synchronized swimming with their tails in the dream were teaching me or offering me an, a, a vision of compassion. So I started to, working with survivors of torture full time for many years, that was my entire clinical practice. My clinical practice is no longer full time. That's still who my clinical practice is. but. And being a mental health professional who was trained to rely on empathy 
and all the excitement about empathy and mirror neurons, which is an extremely reductionistic perspective on what's really going on in the body in terms of shared body states. But I, as I was working with clients, I started to just, there were various times when a, when a client got really angry at me, a client once accused me of mocking him. And I started to think about what is it? And it was actually one time I was on the news with a client and I have a tendency to sit forward. And my mom said, you shouldn't do that. She saw the news. She goes, you shouldn't do that. You get too close to people. She says, you shouldn't get so close to their suffering and you shouldn't be in their face. Mm -hmm. She said, they might feel like, she goes, aren't your clients all survivors of torture? Like you're imposing on them, like you're doing the same thing. I was like, whoa, I hadn't thought about that. So, but I started to just, in ways that are also in the non- narrative, non-cognitive, non-analytical way of knowing, I started to sense in my body, it's not okay to only rely on my empathy. It's creeping my clients out. So I started to explore, and then I found somebody named Henry, Dr. Henry Toby in Denver, who was looking at the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Years later, I found the research of Dr. Tanya Singer. My, my colleague, Ani Buck, introduced me to her work. There's more work. I've explored this with Sharon Salzberg and Roshi Joan Halifax, two meditation teachers. But I just recognize that empathy and compassion were two different things. Deeply connected. I shouldn't say two different. I'm going to go back to the spiral sympathy and then empathy and compassion. The spiraling outward, they're very connected developmental, evolutionarily. And I started to think we as human beings are considered softwired for empathy. The evolutionary trajectory we're on is eventually to be hardwired for compassion or we're not going to make it. I think that landed, downloaded in a dream or something. I, I realized it as an emergence that we're moving towards. And what I realized is that Empathy can be exploited in service of cruelty. A shared body state is very useful to the sadistic abuser. Compassion with compassion, cruelty is not possible. So there's a whole lot of spiritual and ancient teachings in those, but also neuroscience backs that up and also my own experience with my clients. So back to the whales, I was beginning these dreams. I just became almost obsessed with getting in the water with the whales. Some friends directed me to somebody who did free diving and whale swims in the South Pacific. I went on one trip and decided, and, and, and I was said to him, I really want to offer some retreats. Would you want to partner with a movement person? And that wasn't, a, that, that wasn't interested, but he encouraged me to do my own. He's do your own. So I started these retreats swimming with the humpbacks in the South Pacific. And the minute I was under the water with him, I was like, this is why they came back. They evolved into land creatures that were hippo-like. I think hippo, wolf. -like. And then they went back to the ocean, as did dolphins, the cetaceans. All did an emergence of water to land to water. Mm. And I have searched everywhere. Why did they go back to the ocean? Scientists say, don't know, maybe food source. If you read the book, The Blue Mind, it talks about why we're so drawn to the ocean, human beings, right? The calming, certainly we might have different relationships to it, but the blue, the expanse of blue. So I started free diving and spending more time with the whales and just paying attention to what my heart did and my nervous system did and to my neurophysiological state shifts that created these state shifts that I'm emotional, psychological. I'm also going to call them spiritual. And I got it. And I was like, oh, they know these whales and dolphins who are, humans are always saying they might be more intelligent than us, right? There's, that's been out there, that theory for a long time. They have more, have more brain folds than I think anybody in the planet. Blue whales have the biggest heart, right? They have the biggest heart on the planet. So all of these, as I started just thinking about what they had to do to return to the ocean. They had no gills, so they had to 
free dive, long, slow exhales, which promotes vagal tone, which promotes that calm and connected, centered. Their eyes had to come back. So they can't afford to be solely myopic. They have to see the world around them, right? If we're not myopic, we might stop othering. We might actually stop just focusing on somebody as an other, objectifying them. There's this whole context that's constantly moving. So I was like, oh, they're emissaries of love and compassion. They're teaching us about that possibility. They are so damn patient. We have annihilated them in Tasmania that we almost wiped out all the whales that were ever there. Their populations are coming back. Some of them, humpbacks are given 30 years in some places, then they're coming back in some places. We have annihilated their communities. And they still greet people, the gray whales in Mexico, the humpbacks play willingly. We don't go in and force ourselves on them. They seek out interaction. And there's a transmission, and I think it's a transmission from the heart. So it took me a while to get calm enough in the water to be with that big of a creature. Wow, was it frightening at first? It was startling because they come towards you and it was like, whoa. It took me a while to learn that they actually aren't really going to swim into you. I had one whale that would bump me because it had a crush on me and it kept wanting to play with me and sought me out. And I'm just saying it had a crush on me. They're very intelligent and they're very heart-centered. My theory is that their heart-brain ratio is smaller than ours. So the connection, they call, I think they probably have more myelination of the ventral vagal circuitry. I think they might not be as, ex people might say, well, their faces aren't as expressive, right? They're mammals. How could they be? I think the expression is in their heart. It's in their vocalizations, which are profound. It's in the way they tend to one another. So they've been teaching me. They've been teaching me to see differently. They've been teaching me to breathe differently. They've been teaching me to suspend and let go in the ocean. All the efforting we do in gravity, and gravity is an incredible force that shapes us and loves us. I say, if you feel alone, your first lover is gravity. She's right there holding you. But then it's that letting go. And I think that goes back to what I said about the path of greed versus the path of generosity. If we keep accumulating and taking over and claiming territory, we don't shed. We don't let go. So we have to be able to do that as well. So They've taught me about that. And it's hard to describe. It's just being with them. And people write about their eye gaze. Hello, Brilliant Bodies. Just a short interruption to share some exciting news from our first guest, integral anatomist Gil Headley, featured in the episode, The Body is a Gift, A Reverential Journey into the Human Body. Gil has now embarked on a one-of-a-kind tour of the U.S. and beyond to share his gobsmacking presentation, The Nerve Project, Exploring the Nerve Tree in Relationship. Having personally attended, I gotta tell you, this experience will rock your world and expand your appreciation of how brilliantly designed our bodies, specifically our nerve tree, really is. Simply put, nothing has been done quite like this before, and Gil is very excited to share this groundbreaking work with you. To find more information and tickets, go to his website at www.gilhedley.com slash the nerve tour. All information is on the show notes below. So don't miss out. Reserve your tickets now. Your body being will thank you for it. I'll share this because it has been my most profound experience. This last year, I went to Tonga only four months after major spinal surgery. I was still walking awkwardly, had needed a cane. The sand was really hard at first, but it taught me to walk again. But I got in the ocean and I was as free as I had been in months, mm -hmm. the ocean water. And I could keep up with other people, which I can't do walking <laughs> And we were in the water and we were in a place near this year. There was a nursery where mothers and babies were gathering and they were often singing and the sound would come up onto the land. You can't always hear the song from the land. And one of my retreat participants and I both independent of each other, she brought ashes. I brought parting stones of my parents' ashes because I wanted to put them 
in the ocean there because my parents made my first trip possible. They made my first experience of the whales possible. They both believed in it. And the next day we were in that area and we were swimming with this wonderful mother and baby who were doing a lot of spirals. The mother kept spiraling near us and the baby, and we were you know, taking turns, two groups, and I was in the water with them. And I don't go in with a GoPro very often, but I got the GoPro just because I love to hear the song and the dance. And then they started to swim away and I'm watching my whale guide swim away and follow them. And I only had two other people in the water with me who were off to the side quite a bit. And all of a sudden I just felt something that it could have been menacing, but it was just immense. It was just immense. And I turned and I was four feet from an escort. So the escorts are the big, usually male, not always 40, I don't know, 50 tons. They're huge. And they're always floating under the mothers and babies. And they will challenge you if people don't pay attention. The mom will say, we're done. Leave me alone. I'm going to take my baby. We're very respectful. I've seen them charge people who are not respectful. He was right next to me, eye to eye. And I remember just having this moment. I'm sure all kinds of things happened in the trillions of cells that I am and everything. I just, I went like this. I went straight down in the water so that I was vertical and hung there. And it was like I was enveloped. The ocean became awe. I was in awe. It wasn't just ocean water. It was a prayer of awe. He could have taken me out. My group saw it from the boat and they thought that I was, that he had actually squashed me. They saw this massive thing up. He goes by me, his fin, his huge dorsal fin, he just dropped it. And I just hung there in awe, and I was like, what? they're swimming off. I'm letting you know that they're tired. But the word that came up was respect. Mm. He, what I got really clearly is, I just respected you. This ocean is my home. Mm. Respect this place. I got this huge, it brings me to tears, this huge transmission. And as I lead these retreats every year, it's more and more about ocean and climate change and climate crisis. And this is our home. You have to love this enough because this is you. You have to love yourself enough to take care of the ocean. It was profound. He just taught me what respect is at a deep level. It's love. It's loving us enough to love him and all the whales and oceans and other. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was incredible. It makes complete sense. I've just been sitting here crying ever since you've been talking about the whales. I'm just deeply moved by this capacity that we also have to be that expansive in our love. And to be that inclusive, and there's sadness in this too for all the loss and all the damage. Yeah. But there's also this profound sense of longing that I'm feeling for being able to commune cross species the way yeah. you just described. And at the same time, my dog is gnawing on a bone and it's making noise. So I've got to commune with her for a minute and just. Oh, I love dogs. I do too, but it's noisy sometimes. Even though she wants to be in the room with us, it's too noisy. As you're speaking, I'm reminded of the amazing Gregory Colbert, who created Ashes and Snow. Did you see that exhibit, that experience? No. I'm sure you've seen his images because they were extremely famous. They still are. They came out about 10, 12 years ago maybe longer, 15 years ago, I'll find you some images because he and other dancers and just people went and danced and interacted with many different species. He went down and swam with some whales and it's just exquisite. And the whole sense of this exhibit, which was in a huge hangar in Los Angeles and it traveled around the world, where you went in and the music and the sound and the images of all this interspecies communion was so, so resonant, so moving. 
I came out and just sat at the exit and watched how people came out and they were completely regulated when they came yeah. out of yeah. there just yeah. because it's so natural to us in our deep being. We know what it is to live in communion with other species. Yes. And if there is damage and killing, it's in order to survive ourselves in that sacred way of taking life to perpetuate life, which is so different, obviously, from this brain dominion, power over others and disregard for anything that's in the way of whatever it is you want kind of mentality. So anyway, I'm so touched and sad and full of love. And all for you, because Amber, you've just had such vast experience in the world and all your travels and so much you've done and seen and felt. And I just want to thank you. send you love for your amazing humanness. Human <laughs> animalness. No, thank you. But I, I like to say I think exactly. it's more animal than human. I hear you. Mean, humans are animals. I was taught. I love what you said, brain dominion. That's somewhat how I was raised. Not totally, because my father, who's both ancestry, he was settler and Native American, very connected to the wilderness and the wild. And he did the corporate thing and everything he had to do to be a good provider. But he taught me another way. The intuitive, kind of natural, magical children that we clearly were. And are. Also, and are. And yeah. also very curious and very smart. Both of us you more than I, because I chose not to continue in an academic path after getting a bachelor's degree. I didn't want to use my mind in that way. Mm -hmm. But it also gave us a degree of credibility so that we could speak for some of these other experiences and sensibilities and wisdoms that are not respected and they aren't acknowledged. Yeah. And as you were saying before, you have had direct experience with a lot of elders in many different cultures. These are the people that we need to be listening to right now. And if we need to be their emissaries, then yes. so be it because of our degrees or because of our ability to reach people who maybe will listen and wouldn't necessarily sit in a mud hut and listen to those people directly or wouldn't have that opportunity or the honor of doing so. Absolutely. And that's why I invite people into the ocean too, just to listen to her because we're 70% saline water. To listen there and to listen to elders and to listen to wolves or look into the eyes of these creatures that so many people are so afraid of. I love looking to the eyes of a wild animal. If, if I can have a moment, it's usually the birds around here, but just the transmission, there's a gift there for sure. And wouldn't you say, though, that in order to be able to be with them, we have to be able to be with our own body sense, our own animal mm -hmm nature. Yes. It's predicated on our capacity to feel our, our willingness, our wanting to feel our own body being. Absolutely. This is what I love about your podcast because I subscribed and I'm starting to listen. Thank you for doing this because what I'm getting so far, it's a profound reminder to be who we are, not to forget that this is who we are. I love the discussion again with Gil about is the body a vessel for the soul, which is often how I think of it. But from Vodou, from my spiritual tradition, it's not separate. There's these layers of who we are. And I'm sure there's so many different ways to describe it that integrates science and spirit and just reality. I always stay away from the word consciousness because it's such a big word and it gets really out there. But maybe that's part of what it is. But it's this presence. Our body brings us into presence. And our heart is like the guidepost, the beacon, the light. And our mind is a helpful guide for how we sort through and make choices, but it's all got to be happening together constantly. Um, there's that spiral again. Yeah. I, I love how you said that with the vessel thing and even the temple analogy too. That's always bugged me. Like our bodies are a temple because it does, it implies it's a building or it's a container for something yeah. to be poured into. Whereas my sense is that when we are really willing and able to be completely what this is, what we are while we're alive in this form, every cell, every molecule is permeated with this spirit energy 
beingness that we are. It's such a permeation that there's a merge to it that, as I've talked about in (laughs) three previous episodes in May and every single episode, is how we use language to describe our bodies and our body being people usually call our relationship to our body very much affects how we even experience ourselves and each other. So as long as the body is an other, then it's all the more easy to make other people and other things others as well. Yeah. I once wrote an abstract for a chapter that actually surprisingly, and I say surprisingly because it was like 18 years ago, I wanted to write a chapter about the relationship between humans' capacity to torture other people and the desecration of the earth. And they said, oh, I don't think those are connected. (laughs) Why are you writing a book about eco psychology then? But yeah, here's a question. I teach a lot now and all of my classes begin depending upon where the class is and do I have two hours? Do I have 10 days? Whatever I have when I'm teaching begin with the concept of self-care. A lot of people do, oh, I roll, whole body roll, self-respect, self-compassion, self-love. That's what it is. I always begin with that. And the question that I ask students in classes that have a little more substance, a little more time, how do you regularly and consistently violence yourself? How do you commit acts of violence against yourself? And we'll come back around. Sometimes it's a year-long program and then come back to how do you love yourself? How do you tend to yourself? How do you practice self-compassion, self-respect, self-care? I think those are really important questions. And the first people will be like, well, what are you talking about violence myself? Do you skip breakfast when you're somebody who maybe that increases stomach acidity? It can be really simple. Do you rush too fast? Do you not pause enough? Oh, that's not related to the fights that you're having with a really significant person because you're cranky and whatever it is. Not in a critical, judgmental way. I know what I do. It often has to do with the pausing to nourish, the pausing to rest. And then when I get too stirred up, dysregulated, I'm not self-regulating. That term is also getting so overused, but it's a really profoundly important term, self-regulating, co-regulating. I'm not tending to myself enough to be respectful to others in a way that promotes the reciprocity that is meaningful in relationship. Have you also met torturers, not just their victims? What have you observed about them? Do you find that they might be more or less self-violent, self-hating, not self-nurturing? What do you notice about them? So I don't think I can generalize because Everybody I met committed acts of violence or torture as part of being tortured. And I can't say too much because I've worked with people who were like bodyguards to, if I said the names, people would know them. So I I can't even say the names. I've worked with people in countries where it's forced inscription. That's what it's called. I always get prescription, subscription, and inscription mixed up, forced inscription. They don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. So one who was a bodyguard to someone was forced to watch torture and learn how to do it and had to do it. Otherwise, if he didn't, if he refused, he would be tortured and killed. I don't know what I would do in that instance. I really don't know. And when people are so certain, oh, I would never do that. I have met people who have been forced to torture others as part of their being abused, being violated, being oppressed, being controlled, who wanted nothing more than to return to their loving family. That is so universal. However we define family, it might be a partner and children, it might be a dog, it might be the cluster of trees around our cottage, whatever it is. That is utterly universal, and it is a major expression of how we love and how we connect. So I don't know what I would do. So the people that I've worked with, some have seemed to have less perceivable, and that's a very intentional word, perceivable remorse than others. That could have to do with how much they were, I'm going to use the term brainwashed, what their abuse consisted of. Some I know a lot of the details, some I don't 
how much they were forced to disconnect from themselves. We talked sadistic and non-sadistic abusers and did what they had to do, and they weren't connected to it. So they seem not remorseful and dissociated and numb. That was how they did what helped them survive. Others stay connected. We all have the ability to be cruel. <laughs> Nobody should kid themselves that they would never do horrible things to another person. We all have that capacity. And it's more dangerous if we don't name it and own it than if we do. We all have that capacity. And so those that I've worked with that have touched into that and have been willing to work through it, it's been quite profound. And I don't even know how to articulate it, but I'm going to borrow from Asian medicine and wisdom, the yin yang, which comes from Taoism, that male feminine, the connected, seemingly opposite, but not opposite. That's where I've come to know that energy. These were human beings who shared many similarities in humanness to me, who touched into that ability to be cruel and somehow, I'm going to call it, cross that line, that fuzzy line. And there's many things that drove them there. I actually think of another client who was forced, I talked about him, I did the Marion Chase lecture at the Dance Therapy Conference in 2022 in Montreal, and he's one of my greatest teachers of compassion. He was a sniper for his own country, captured by the country there at war, forced to snipe villages of women and children in his own country. Otherwise, he would be killed. And all he wanted was to get back to his wife and kids. That's all he wanted. And the things that they did to him were horrible. Prior to that, he was a proud soldier who served his country. He was a strong, really strong, big guy and just emitted strength. I worked with a tortured soul who was. He was cruel. He was doing all these things that were self-sabotaging. He actually violated people a couple times just in terms of punching a fight, something like that. And he kept coming in. And no matter what I did, whether it was cognitive or somatic, it was just like, I'm going to swear it was like, F you. And one day I just got it. I was just like, self-loathing. I felt it in my gut when he came in and told me a particularly horrific story of something he'd done. He'd cut the braid off of a Native American who'd stolen gas at the gas station he was working at and went mm, to me because of my ancestry. But also the way he talked about it had elements of racism in it. And I had to just sit there and I was holding that and holding the dignity and the strength and the loving father and partner, all the things that he was. And my stomach just, it was like I spit up the word self loathing. And I remember I just looked at him. For a moment, and I took a breath and I said, I see what you're doing. I get it now. All these things that you're sharing with me about the terrible things that you do and the horrible person you are, and why you can't get better, why you won't do this work. I said, You want me to hate you as much as you hate you? And I said, I'm never going to do that. I said, I'm always going to choose love. And it was just. He got really pissed. He said, F you. And he got really angry. And mm, I don't know what we did. He walked out, didn't come back for a few weeks. And then he came back and in the most profound gesture of respect. Part of his journey was deciding whether to stay in the U.S. where he kept getting denied asylum, which had to do with some of the weirdness of his case. What was spoken, what was unspoken. He wanted to go back to his family and it was really dangerous to do so. And he came in one day he carrying this plant. The only thing, every time I tried to resource him, that term that's very used in somatics and trauma, the only friend he had in this tiny apartment he'd been living in that was bare was this plant. He loved, he and his wife loved plants. And the most profound gesture of respect that he believed existed was to bow to somebody. And I remember I tried to work that into our somatic work. We were doing some yoga-like work. I was trying to elicit a bow to himself. And he came in and he wouldn't let me talk. And he just said, I'm going home. I'm going back. And he put the plant down and he bowed and he walked out. And he was like, don't come after me. He what? chose love. He yeah, chose, he chose love. love. He chose love. And it's interesting because I always worried what happened to him. And he's one of the only clients who just about eight years ago, his son wrote to me and basically said, you can answer once. I'll never answer again. I'm, he named who his father was. And he said, this is what he's doing now. And he wants you to know that he never forgot what you told him. Hey everyone, it's Ali, switching hats for a moment to share a bit about one of my somatic therapy offerings. 
Personal geometry adapted from family constellation work is a highly efficient somatic method and an incredible tool for therapists, healers, and teachers of all types. Now, after years of applying personal geometry in clinical environments and private practice, I'm offering online training in this highly effective method. Personal geometry is a body-based method to quickly get to the unconscious loyalties and the body maps underlying our relationships, patterns, and addictions. By giving the body a way to speak, we can access previously hidden pivotal insights that often evade traditional therapies. Online classes in personal geometry are available on a rolling basis throughout the year, and our next cohort begins soon. So for more information on the course or to sign up, find the link in the show notes or head to www.alimezey.com slash personal dash geometry dash foundations. Can't wait to share this groundbreaking method with you. People who have tortured others. I don't know. It's complex. Yeah. The one who was the bodyguard to somebody who was so utterly cruel. I don't know. I don't know how many things have affected the spiral of that person's unique biophysio spiritual cosmology, but I know that we can all get there. Yeah. When you said they were inscribed, there was inscription. I thought yeah. of in family constellation work, we talk about the hidden loyalties in order to belong. A lot of this work was founded by Bert Hellinger, who was a prisoner of war in World War II. And he was asking the question, how can people do such horrible yeah. things? That was one of the cornerstone questions that gave rise to this amazing work. Yeah. And one of the main answers is our need to belong, our imperative to belong, and how families inscribe their children into all kinds of different membership and memberships in order to belong that can look in all kinds of ways. Look at our former president and what he's doing and the cruelty he must have been raised in and steeped in to be the cruel person that he clearly is, incapable of empathy. So I think the whole idea of inscription and our need to belong, as well as not just survive, but belong, must be at the base of a lot of these behaviors I'm curious about to what extent your sense of these people who have perpetrated tremendous suffering on others seem or not seem dissociated, to what extent they need to dissociate from their bodies mm -hmm. in order to be able to perpetrate this harm. That's one part of the question. And the other part of the question is whether victims of torture and any trauma for that matter seem to or tend to be able to heal more easily if they either haven't dissociated or have dissociated, or does it depend on the individual? In other words, is dissociation sometimes quite useful, not just a unfortunate byproduct of having a terrible experience? Because in the trauma world, we tend to talk about dissociation as a bad thing, and certainly as a coping mechanism. But how do you see it affecting the process of healing? Dissociation is always useful. It's adaptive. So one of the things being in the clinical world, people will say, I'll use your term byproduct. In the moment of exposure, most people agree if we dissociate, which can happen because of a sympathetic adrenal mobilization and fear response. It can happen because of a dorsal vagal complete shutdown. It can happen in the blended state of sympathetic adrenal dorsal freeze. Some people think dissociation is only shut down. There's different qualities to it. There's different ways to do it. It has so much to do with the person. It has to do with the kind of day they're having, with the moment, with their body. There's so much complexity. And in that moment where we are forced into survival, it saves us. So it's adaptive. It continues to be adaptive. I don't like the term maladaptive. Yes, it can disrupt our function. It can disrupt our relationships. It disrupts everything. But until the body, until our body, until we who are body infused with spirit, neurosept enough, safe as can be. I don't like the term safety, relative safety. 
safe as can be, comfort, familiarity, we're going to keep doing it because it keeps us anchored in survival. A lot of people, and this often drives me crazy about my beloved continuum community, but other people do it as well. Survival. You don't want to stay stuck in survival. I bow to all the people I know who are stuck in survival because of what they've been through. I bow to that. And I know that survival is the path to, to thriving. It's a path. It's a path, right? It keeps us here. So, yes, and it can be destructive. Dissociation can be destructive, right? If you dissociate at work, somebody can get hurt. I've had clients that they were operating heavy machinery and got hurt. Things can happen, but at the level of the body, our neurophysiology, biology, it's adaptive because we're not perceiving that we're safe as can be. One of my colleagues, Les Aria, I love what he says. He says, we're not responsible for what we did in that moment, what I call the moment of exposure. We are responsible for committing to how we, as we learn, because first people have to learn that they're doing it. If you're dissociating, you might not know you're doing it, right? And you might not believe the people who are telling you what you're doing. That's what a lot of my work is about, to help people learn to recognize their own biological reactivity or responsivity. And then I call it notice, name, note. He calls it nurture. And then you start to work with it. We can only be responsible for recognizing, acknowledging it, bowing to it, and then doing the work to shift how we meet those moments when we get reactive and dissociate because that person has the same color shirt as the perpetrator or wears the same cologne, or the movement is just like the bullets flying by, whatever it is. We have to come to an awareness about that and then change it. That's all we're responsible for, which is a lot to be responsible for. So I think it's always adaptive at the level of the body, really. So is your goal in healing, sounds like it's not necessarily to re associate every one of your clients no definitely reassociating with dissociation it's a heavy load you're missing part of life you can be missing things when i say it's adaptive it's that the body is still reactive because of the exposure or multiple exposures whether it's single or long term because it's subconscious the autonomic nervous system all these it's subconscious the body is still being adaptive because it's still neurocepting that something is not right. The bridge between the implicit and explicit, the bridge between neuroception and shifting our perception so that we start to see the world as it really is. That's the work that I do. So yes, I would love for my clients never to dissociate again, but I just don't pathologize the dissociation because it's serving them. It's serving them because they're still living in fear or terror, or there are still elements of that woven into the matrix of who they are. Obviously, I don't want them to continue in that way. I also respect people who maybe can't, I don't know what I want to say, shed, shift through all of the fear or terror. There may always be an imprint. Trauma is life-changing. I can't stand when people say trauma recovery. What do you recover? Yeah, you get some things back, but it's not a full rec recovery. means you get it back. You don't release stuff. What do you release? You can do nervous discharge, but what do you release? It's a restoration. I, I coined the term restorative process many years ago. It's a restoration. You build the house again, the paint color is different, you put in different roofing because of, and different windows, you restore, it's a restoration. So there's always going to be an imprint, and hopefully people don't dissociate. And you asked about the level of dissociation with people who commit the heinous act of torture. Never having seen anybody, well, actually I did once, that's actually part of why I got into this work. I woke up in the middle of the night to screams. I was in a remote village in Nepal, and <laughs> being the curious person that I am, my roommate was like, don't go out there. I went out and saw somebody tied and being whipped and interfered, which might have been dangerous, certainly in some places. 
but I just saw it. It was so fast. I don't know. Again, the people that I've worked with have described having to check out, having to numb. I'm using their language, which I think is dissociation, to be able to do it. They were experiencing terror or fear inside because they knew the outcome if they didn't. So their body was in an altered state. There's another way to think think about it. Do you think self-loathing is necessarily also a dissociative state? I don't know if I've ever thought about that. Self-loathing. That's a really good question. I think sometimes it could be dissociative, and I'm putting this out as a question. It might also be if we're so in a body that feels like a minefield, if we're in touch with the disgust, the horror maybe of what we've done or participated in or what we've experienced. Lots of people are survived in ways to intentionally shame them, to create the shame. It could also be not dissociative. It could be just really like almost too much, too big of a dose of what's in the body at the moment. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I'm thinking about it myself. I went through a period a couple of weeks recently of feeling a lot of self-loathing. And I'm trying to feel back to what that was like. And I was not able to connect to the truth of my, for lack of a better word, better self. Like I wasn't able to feel a much more expansive and kinder experience of myself. And of course, when you're in that state, you believe what you're experiencing about yourself is true. That's why it's such a vicious circle and why you continue, why at least I, when I've felt that, have such a hard time getting out. It's like trying to get out of a barrel that's just slippery and you can't climb up the sides. Yeah. And it, and there is this sense that I I can't reconnect to this memory of who I really am, but I don't feel like that's who I am. So for myself, I think it probably is somewhat dissociative. So next time, if I experience that again, I'll try to remember, this isn't really who I am, (laughs) because it sure can feel like it's who you are when you're in it. Well, it's interesting because like, yes. And then I also think of, um, I'm going to call a social tendency, because last week I taught a class for the Psychedelic Society of the UK. And one of the things that we played with was letting our dark shine. It was on the solstice. And I was like, why do we always say let our light shine? Again, I'm back to the capacities that we all have for darkness and violence. When people are really stuck in that story of self-loathing, shame, yes, it's not who they really are. And is it part Mm. of how, I don't know how to say this, is it part of who we are? It's certainly a real response to things that have happened. I have shame around things. I have, I I know my way of expressing that and I know what can trigger that now. Is that part of this evolutionary trajectory from empathy to compassion? Is that part of what we're working out as a species? Is there some way in which recognizing that whatever it is, you make a mistake, you do something you regret, whatever it is. We're talking about much bigger things, torturing other human beings, being tortured, where people are often programmed, literally, to hate themselves, to have self-loathing and to be ashamed. I know about IFS parts work. Is that part of what gets integrated? Everything in its equal, whatever part. Is it alchemy? Is it just part of the alchemical creative lineage we are? And can we transform lead into gold? (laughs) Well, I think a couple things. Ultimately, each time such a thing, shame or self-hatred arises, there's always the challenge of, can I love myself through it? Can I find at least a speck of the kind aspect of myself that can love even this? But I also think that I I had such a fantastic conversation with Philip Shepard in episode three, and we talk a lot about how this view, actually Gil mentioned this too, this view that we are these separate beings. Mm -hmm. And what you just mentioned, I think is so important that we can be thinking that I'm experiencing self-loathing about Allie, me, myself, 
when really I might be picking up a wave of it going across the planet, or I might be picking it up through the wall and a neighbor's going through something, or it might not just be me who's having that experience and I'm the one resonating with it and having to process it and I can buy into it being all about me because we tend to think that we're enclosed in this skin and therefore this is what I am. Anyway, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a lot of mystery going on for sure. <laughs> it's such an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Just coming back to my clients, and I'm going to say this in a simplistic way because it's not really simplistic, but one of the things that's been restorative and at times transformative is the recognition that all of these things that their body is doing, dissociation, I think dissociation is behavioral expression of the shutdown or the fear, or the freeze, the fight or flight. It's when it gets to be too much. When they recognize that it really is their body continuing to promote, to cheerlead their survival, it's really helpful. That alone starts to shift towards a reconnection to their humanity. I was just going to say, which then goes into the whole thing about how victims can be blamed for yeah. going into shutdown as if it's a failure that one didn't fight in a situation where right. body was smart enough to recognize this is not a situation to even try. You're outmanned here. You're outgunned. Yeah. There's no way you're going to get out of this. So you better shut down. And I love how you're saying that is an expression of love. Yeah. Yeah. It's uncomfortable and it's awful when it's perpetuated through our interaction with the environment. This always leads me to the what I'm called the social responsibility question. What is society's responsibility to those who've experienced oppression, racism, torture, war? I'm trying to remember Ed Tick's book that came out, might have been 20 years ago, about veterans returning, where he traces the history of war, the soul of the warrior. What was that called? I don't know, but I'll put it in the episode notes. How warriors were sent out lovingly and by the community and then welcomed home and went through whatever processes, whether they were ceremonies or cleansing processes, whatever it is, that's gone now. We all deserve that. And so when we consider how much in the last, I'm going to say 20, 30 years, we've gone from 5%, I think World War II, maybe that was World War I, 5% civilian casualties to look at Ukraine, look at Gaza the civilian casualties of war. Now, where's the front line? I think about this all the time. And so what is humanity? What is society doing in terms of restoring, being the bridge, being the link between when people rejoin society? I don't know how else to say it. Veterans come home, refugees arrive on the shores of another land or are expected to instantly assimilate into U.S. society. C come on. Not only is it, you're talking about different cultures, you're also talking about trauma. People who've experienced things that we're not honoring our responsibility to tend to those who suffer. We're not. Yeah. So in light of that, can you just talk a bit, because I don't get to keep you very much longer, sadly, um, and there's so much to talk about, but can you talk a bit about the importance of the body and attending to the body, whether that's veterans coming back from war or torture victims in your office, in the process of this restoration, what exactly is being restored and what does the body have to do with that restoration? I think the body has everything to do with that restoration. I think back when I had a much more simplified understanding of what I was doing, I'd say, well, the body is home or the body is a site of all human experience. I've said that many times. It is. It is. It's where we live our lives. We are movement. Emily used to say that. We don't do movement. We are this. We're an organism. We are living. I'm not a human body in my life. I'm living. That's who I am. So one of the things that I think is really profound is to teach people. We call it psychoeducation or psychosocial education in the clinical world. When my clients understand that their body is still adaptively cheerleading their survival. That's really helpful. That's one of the most important things. I have to do it in many different ways. Some people, I might really go into the nervous system. I've had clients get excited about body-mind centering, the polyvagal theory. Some clients that go into it, some of it I talk about in a more creative or just relevant way to them. 
But I think the essence, and this is a term that came out of a conversation I had with Steve Porges years ago, we were teaching in Norway, and he started to invite me to teach not just from my clinical dance therapy, but from my ceremonial way. He wanted to learn about that. And we were chatting, and I said, the thing that unites all of this, neuroscience, what you do as the researcher, the clinical world, and the ceremonial medicine world, is state shifting. That's what happens in ceremony. So whatever it takes for me to promote, support, help my clients, state shifting, talked about this earlier, recognizing what do they do? What makes them reactive? Maybe they don't know that it's the color of shirts or the filtering of light. Recognition, acknowledgement, noticing it, being aware of it, naming it, owning it, and working with it. So at the level of the autonomic nervous system, it's recognizing the patterns. I always say the autonomic nervous system, the nervous system is pattern and it's possibility. We recognize the patterns we're in now, what serves us, what doesn't. And then we recognize the nervous system is constantly, it's a beacon for curiosity. Curiosity can guide the nervous system when we're in a state of enough wholeness safe as can be. So that's what gets restored as much as possible. So that's at a very physiological level. People start to self-regulate. I invite, I talk about self-regulation or just changing the way you feel (laughs) because not everybody wants to go around saying, I'm self-regulating. What does that really mean? State shifting. What helps you calm? What helps you energize? What helps you center? What helps you ground? What helps you focus? What helps you pause and expand? That's what the work is. And it could be through breath. It could be through affirmations. It could be through movement. We might choreograph a dance. We might do some simple structure practices. And then it's weaving the meaning. There is an important cognitive narrative component to it. It's in whatever that person's relationship is to their life, what life is for them. It's the meaning of that. We restore that. And belonging. I think it was like, 16 years ago, I created a framework for refugee mental health and belonging was, that was the restoration. It's a sense of belonging as much as possible. That could be a cultural thing. It could be family relationship. It's at so many different levels from the micro neurophysiological to the macro global communal spiritual. It's all of that. The body seeds all of that because we're living. (laughs) We're the garden in all of its phases, the fallow earth in the winter and the big field of wildflowers in the summer. We're we're all that all the time. So (laughs) that's what I think. I just have a few more questions. Four. I'll try to stick to four short ones. What did happen when you tried to interfere in Nepal? They let him go. They let him go. And how did you interfere? What did you do? This is a long time ago. This was the 80s. I yelled and I said, what are you doing? And somebody there said in broken English, stolen. When I remember saying, did you see this person steal something? It actually was a Sherpa who I'd seen on the mountain because you're in and out of hiking with different people. I was trekking. So you'd see groups of people. And I think it was naive, but I've always been, (laughs) my dad said I was born dancing and fighting. Boom. I was like, stop it. Because what they were doing, it was awful. It was really his skin cut. So I think I probably startled them. And so they, they let him go. They untied him and let him go. And he ran. And then I remember seeing like, oh shit. <laughs> what did you? Just... And I remember seeing him later on the mountain with his group, Sherpaing again. And what I heard, and I'm now remembering this later, was that something got stolen and somebody had accused him, but nobody could actually say that they'd seen him do it. It was one of those, but he was running at a certain time. So it must have been him. And again, it wasn't political torture. Political torture is a whole different thing, but it was physical. They were squeezing him with the rope and it was awful. So. So imagine in all the places you've been in the world, in war zones and places of natural disasters and all kinds of situations, you've been in a lot of very dangerous places in dangerous situations. And your life must have been threatened multiple times, hasn't it? Have you often wondered if you were going to survive? And if so, how did that inform your body being? I've never, so calculated risk. I've always known I'm taking a risk. 
So I do practical things. I have a will, stuff like that. Never occurred to me that I'm not. It occurs to me. I shouldn't say it that cavalier. I trust myself. Just to draw from a longer conversation my husband once had with my mother when nobody could reach me in Darfur because the government had shut everything down. They had this big attack. What my husband said to my mother is she knows what she's doing. She knows how to trust herself. And I trust her instincts and her abilities. I trust myself. I'm comfortable. They're awful environments. For some reason, it's an environment that I like to work in. I like to work in conflict situations and war zones. I trust my instincts. So I don't think about, I'm sure I've been at various times. I didn't know. It was time where somebody once in Rwanda, we'd been in a car accident. Some guy had hit us and unbeknownst to us, he was following my colleague and I at one point we got pulled off the road and he put a machine gun in my face and was talking to the colleague. And at the time I didn't speak French, but my colleague did. And so, yeah, I, I've been close. I didn't get killed. He ended up negotiating us out of it. I've been in places where a suicide bomb goes off five blocks away or there's mortar f- shooting, machine gun fires, woken me up in the middle of the night in this apartment with a lot of glass and port au And it was like, oh, I better get in. I just went into the bathroom. And I'm like, I better get away from the glass. I just do what needs to be done. And then I can go back to sleep normally. So... I was going to ask you to describe what you mean by you trust your instincts. And maybe that's what you just said. I do what needs to be done. Yeah. But is that always a, a bodily sensation for you? Or sometimes it's you're hearing guidance or what is instinct like for you? I am very focused. I become very focused. I think I'm very sensory in those moments. I bet I'm smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing everything. I think it's my animal body. I drop into that. And I can often hear things really, I can hear in layers. I smell, I just pay attention to everything. And I'm focused, but I also keep my periphery awake. Emily Conrad used to say that she felt, she thought that I was like a whale or a dolphin and that I slept with one side of my brain on and off, but I still slept. And I had somebody reflect to me who was out in the field with me for a long time, who was from a headquarters of a big NGO who wanted to come see the humanitarian work, was constantly dysregulated, constantly freaking out. And he finally one day looked at me, he goes, I don't know how you do it. I keep looking at you and I either see the Buddha or I see a Marine, which is, and I was like, both. It's both. It's that focused attention, (laughs) very sensory. I'm in my yield, the yield drawing from body, mind centering. I'm connected to gravity, bringing me down. It's supporting me and I'll use her if I need to. It's that. Mm -hmm. It's the state I'm in. So when you were a child, could you have imagined you would be working in war zones and doing the work you're doing? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't have a a particular memory. My dad said I was always a social justice person. Mm -hmm. Animals were my big thing. My first volunteer job when I was very wee was to pet the cats at the animal shelter. This was in the 60s when the animal shelters, they're still terrible places for animals. Always brought home the birds with the broken wings. Just always took care of them. Always... Couldn't stand clicks. I grew up in a really clicky place, just hovered, dropped below or above, just was kind to everyone. Now I just have three more questions. Okay. (laughs) Actually, I have 30 more, but I'm just going to ask you three. So how would you define embodiment? I said something before that I think it's the physical connection to our presence, the physicality of our presence. It's being able to connect. Some people might call this somatic awareness. Know where my body is, time and space, locale, connect to my inner sense, sensation, interocepting, and being able to share that, express that, bridging that to the outer. I think that's part of embodiment. I don't know if it's all of embodiment, but it's really a presence in our physicality. And what do you like best about being your body self, living as you described it? It's an interesting question, given that I'm in this long healing from spinal surgery that immobilized me. I couldn't walk for weeks and have had to 
regain a lot of movement capacities. So I've had a lot of frustration. I love to dance. I love to dance. I love my body's. I love me, my living, me as living, me as body. I love me as dancer, like expressing and moving freely. I also love me as animal. Like I love crawling and sniffing and I love, there's a word I'm trying to find. I love how my body is discovery and curiosity, how it's really earthy and connected to the earth. I love that. You're a marvel. You're just stunning, Amber. Thank you so much. I could talk to you on and on. Well, we have to but talk I'm, more. We just know that we've reconnected. Yeah. Clearly, clearly do. And I'm sure our listeners would love to hear more of you too. And of course, all the notes of how to reach you and how to participate in your offerings will be in the notes as well. So good to be with you. This was an amazing conversation. You're glorious. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed this episode, please give that like button a little click. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. I've got a bunch of fascinating guests lined up with trailblazing experts in the field that I'm really excited to share with you. I'm eager to hear from you too, so don't be shy. Drop a comment below, share your thoughts, suggestions, or just say hi. Your insights on this episode mean the world to me. So go ahead, spread some love, like, subscribe, and share your thoughts below. Your support keeps this channel going strong, and I'm genuinely grateful for each and every one of you. Till next time, stay brilliant. I hope you found this episode inspiring. If you'd like to learn more about the many ways I'm encouraging and guiding the wider world to reclaim the brilliance of the body, please visit my website at www.alimezey.com. Thanks so much for listening. Until the next episode and beyond, reclaim your brilliant body. The Brilliant Body Podcast was created by Ali Mazay. This episode was co-produced and edited by Ali Mazze and Florence Popoff. Thanks to Rachel Fell and Nina Demore for additional editing, to Florence Popoff also for my social media management, and to composer Blair, Mr. One Man Ben Wilson for my theme music.